In this video, we're going to talk about the difference uh, between directional and non-directional tests of statistical significance. Now, up uh, to this point in the video series, we've been only discussing non-directional tests of significance, and that's those are tests that are typically called two-tailed tests. And the reason they're called two-tailed tests is because the critical region, the region of rejection, is loaded onto both sides of the sampling distribution. So if you look at a sampling distribution with alpha equaling 0.05, you'll notice that there's one region of rejection on the left side and one region of rejection on the right side. Now, the amount of area in the region of rejection on the left, or the critical region, is 0.025, and on the right it's 0.025, so it's evenly split between the two sides. That means that the critical value for rejecting the null hypothesis on the left means a z-score that is smaller than negative 1.96, and on the right is a z-score that is larger than positive 0.196. Okay? So that's a non-directional test of significance or a two-tailed test. Now, there may be times, though, when we would want to conduct what are called directional tests of significance. Okay? And these are one-tailed tests. And in a one-tailed test, we load the entire region of rejection on only one side of the sampling distribution. Now, it could be on either the left or the right, depending upon the uh, research question and our hypotheses, but it's going to only be on one side. So, for example, we might load the entire region of rejection, all 0.05 of the area under the curve, to the left side. And when we do that, that means the critical value now changes, okay? So we would reject the null hypothesis if the z-score that we obtain, or whatever test statistic it is that we're using, uh, is less than negative 1.645, okay? Now we could do the same thing on the other side of the distribution. We could load all 0.05 of the area on the right side of the distribution. <laughs> and in that case, we would have to have a z-score that would exceed positive 1.645. Now, one of the things that you're probably noticing is that when we do that, when we load the region of rejection on one side or the other, then correspondingly, it doesn't show up on the other side. So one of the downsides to doing a directional test is that if you have a sample mean, you observe a sample mean that is an extreme score on the other side of the sampling distribution, you will never be able to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so that means that there must be certain conditions that have to be met in order to justify a single-sided one-tailed test or a directional test of significance. So why would we choose a directional test? Well, the problem is that non-directional tests, two-tailed tests, may be too conservative when there is little to no likelihood of a sample mean being located in one tail of the sampling distribution. Now, as sort of a fun example, why don't we just say, okay, we're really interested in measuring people's happiness. And so we know what the mean of the happiness and standard deviation of happiness might be in, say, the population. And then we expose a sample to uh, play 20 minutes with adorable young puppies. Okay, so that's that's our example. So what we'd have here is a sampling distribution of happiness in the population. Okay, and, and just for the sake of argument, of course, the z-score is going to be zero. And if we we're running a two-tailed test, the regions of rejection would be located on the left and the right, split evenly at 0.025, right? But here's the problem. Um, it's pretty inconceivable that playing with puppies for 15 to 20 minutes, it's going to make people extremely unhappy, right? So if that's the case, there's little to no chance that this region, right, the region of rejection, is ever going to come into play, right? So uh, the, the, the idea that playing with puppies by itself would make people so unhappy that a sample mean because of that particular independent variable manipulation would end up way off in the tail to the left, it's just so unlikely that we don't even think about it. So what that means is that the functional size of the region of rejection 
is equivalent to what is only on the right side of the sampling distribution, which is 0.025. So we have in fact halved the region of rejection for all practical purposes. So that seems to be an overly conservative test, right? For uh, whether or not playing with puppies actually makes people happier than perhaps not playing with puppies. Um, <clears throat> so to address that issue and to return the alpha to uh, 0 0.05, what we would want to do is take this entire region that was on the left side of the distribution is now no longer in play and load it to the right. And that becomes a one-tailed test or a directional test. Okay, so what is the effect of a directional test on notation of the null and alternative hypotheses? Well, let's start with non-directional tests and so we can just go over what those look like. And depending upon your textbook, the actual statement of what the null hypothesis will look a little different from textbook to textbook. Authors have their own ways of stating these things. So I'll put down a few different ways where the null hypothesis might be stated. So for example, we might say in the null hypothesis that the sample mean is equal to the population mean. Okay, there's no difference between a sample mean and a population mean. Therefore, uh, the null hypothesis we would fail to reject. We could also say something equivalent by saying, well, the sample mean minus the population mean equals zero, means exactly the same thing. Or we could say that the population mean for the experimental condition is equal, a value equal to the population, right? So the experimental condition uh, represented by the sample is equal to the mean for the population uh, where there was no experimental manipulation. So those would all pretty much be equivalent. Now the alternative research hypothesis is of course H sub one, and in a, uh, a non-directional test, we would simply say, hey, the sample mean is not equal to the population mean, or the sample mean minus the population mean does not equal zero, or the population mean represented by the experimental condition of the sample is not equal to the value of the population mean uh, represented uh, by the null hypothesis. So the values are equal to the population mean. Okay, now the key thing here is this, right? It's this equal sign. In a non-directional test, the operator here really is either the equal sign or the not equal sign, okay? When we move to directional tests, we're gonna say something just a little bit different. So the notation is modified to reflect the direction of the test. So for example, if we load the region of rejection all the way onto the right, uh, let's start with the um, research hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis first, because it's a little easier to understand this way. If we load it all the way to the right, then what we're essentially saying is that the alternative hypothesis is supported if the sample mean is greater than mu, right, in the population. Because here's mu, it would be right at zero, the center of the sample distribution. And then we're saying, hey, the sample mean is somewhere out here. So it must be significantly greater than mu. We could also say that the difference between them is greater than zero, or that mu of the experimental condition is greater than the value of the population mean represented by the null hypothesis. <clears throat> now, the null hypothesis would then be re-expressed as in the first case, sample mean is less than or equal to mu. And the reason we see le say less than is because any sample mean falling in this area below the critical value, right, all the way to the tail on the other side, um, is in fact uh, in the area where we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So even if the sample mean ended up way out here on the far left, we would not reject the null. And then of course we re-express it in these other ways as well. And again, the key here are these operators. We're now using greater than signs for the uh, alternative hypothesis or the research hypothesis. We're um, using less than or equal to signs for the null. Now, if we flip the uh, region of rejection to the other side of the sampling distribution, then what happens is exactly what you would expect to happen. We simply reverse those signs. So let's take a look. If we load everything onto the left side, the critical region onto the left side of the distribution, so now it's over here, 
Okay. Notice that we need now a z-score less than negative 1.645. Okay. Then the operators now have now flipped for the expression of the alternative hypothesis. And um, the, the null hypothesis now goes in the opposite direction that one we saw in the previous slide. So you just need to keep these in mind because when you're working through uh, solving problems, there frequently will be questions of you to express both the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And for whatever textbook that you're using, just use the format that they use. But just be aware that in directional tests, that we've moved now away from the equal and not equal sign to the greater than less than signs or greater than, than equal to and less than equal to signs. Okay, what is the effect of a directional test on power of the test? In other words, the ability to correctly uh, reject a false null hypothesis. Well, it turns out directional tests are more powerful than non-directional tests. And the reason for this is that the critical value for rejecting the null hypothesis uh, in a directional test is now closer to the mean of the sampling distribution than in a non-directional test. And because the critical value is closer to the center of the sampling distribution, it requires less of a difference between the sample mean and the population mean to reject the null hypothesis. So directional tests, one-tailed tests, tend to be more powerful than two-tailed tests. And then the question is, when do you make the decision? When do you make the decision to um, you know, run a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? Well, you always make the decision to make to run either a one-tailed directional test or a two-tailed non-directional test prior to conducting statistical analyses. And the reason for this is really simple. This is called an a priori decision regarding the analysis. And the reason is really simple because if you don't do that, you're in danger of fishing for results, right? Let's say you ran a two-tailed test, a non-directional test, and then what happened was that the result was almost statistically significant. It just becomes too tempting to then post hoc after the fact, justify running a one tail test, which you would know would actually um, gain statistical significance. Okay. So that's kind of fishing. You know, when you, when you know something uh, will turn out um, after you've run an, an analysis, that's not the same um, condition as before running the analysis. So it's not a good research practice at all, right? We don't want to do that. We want to specify whether we're running a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test before we actually run the statistical test. And so why would you, again, when, um, when, you're have, when you have good reason to believe that an outcome on one side of the sampling distribution, in other words, a, a statistical test result, that would locate a sample mean on one side of the sampling distribution is super unlikely to happen, right? It just either doesn't make sense that it could happen or there's a strong literature base already existing that tells you it won't happen, but you have to have a really strong reason to justify running a one-tailed test. Otherwise, the default pretty much is to just run two-tailed tests, non-directional tests. Let's sum up the big picture. Non-directional tests load the region of rejection, called the critical region, equally on both sides of the sampling distribution. These are the most common tests that we run. Directional tests, on the other hand, load the region of rejection on just one side. And that's why they're called one-tailed tests as opposed to, say, a two-tailed test. So running a directional test of statistical significance does not change the alpha level. Alpha stays the same. So uh, in a two-tailed test, if alpha was equaling 0.05, you'd have 0.025 of the area in the region of rejection split between both sides of the sampling distribution. When you run a one-tailed test, it's the entire 0.05 is loaded on one side. So we're actually not changing the level of alpha. However, directional tests of st statistical significance are in fact more powerful than non-directional tests because the critical value for a sample mean to fall into the critical region is now closer to the center of the sampling distribution. That's gonna make it a little easier for a sample mean to fall into the region of rejection.
And then the decision to run a directional test of significance should be made prior to running the statistical test, not afterwards. That's not a good research practice. Okay, and next up on the list is we're going to be looking at the one sample t test and then uh, actually uh, walking through the steps and procedures for conducting it.